Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jerry Shockey. I oversee all the educational programs here at the Pro Football of Fame. I want to welcome everyone to the uh, Pro Football of Fame in Canton, Ohio. And uh, for our new... oh, can we ask all the groups to please keep their mics muted? Thank you. And uh, for the new series that we just launched about a year ago called Heart of a Hall of Famer. And, and really what we mean by this, one of the things that, that can be said about our Hall of Famers is that if they're you know, if their God-given ability didn't lie in professional football, uh, that they would have gone on to be Hall of Famers in, in some other endeavor, whether it's being a, a plumber, a pastor, a teacher, uh, whatever it might be. Because at the core of what made them great wasn't their athletic ability, but it was their core character. It was their determination, their dedication, their leadership, their ability to persevere. And all these six pillars that you guys have all been researching, the trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairing, caring, and citizenship. And many of which, as you probably know, or, or you'll find out today, many of which have gone on to exemplary careers beyond their, their football careers. And we have a great example of someone here today, um, a person by the name of Art Monk, who was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2008. Uh, but before we get to Mr. Monk's opening remarks, uh, I would like to recognize some of the folks that helped make this program today possible. And we first obviously want to thank our folks at uh, Tamburg, now part of Cisco. They are our, our good friends there in Virginia and all across the country, I should say. They're the ones opening their doors today to uh, host Art Monk at their studios in Reston, VA. So I'd like to thank uh, uh, Carrie Best and Jennifer and Scott and Tony and, and Carolyn and all the other folks that, that uh, uh, really played a, a key role in, in making this happen. So thanks to our friends there. And also our friends in, in Columbus, Ohio, just south of us, E-Tech, Ohio. Most of you schools know, know them personally now because you probably call them. They're the ones bridging this conference, all the sites together, and the fine folks that are uh, getting all the sites together, Derek and Aaron and, and Josh and Michelle and all those folks on the help desk. Uh, we appreciate you guys making this possible as well. Obviously, this program is not possible without the teachers and all the folks that are planning this program. Not only teachers, librarians, uh, district uh, um, technology coordinators, uh, school technology coordinators, a whole host of folks going to making this possible. So we want to thank all of you. And obviously we'd like to thank the students uh, for being part of this. I know a lot of you put in a lot of time and preparation. You've been researching the six pil core pi pillars of character. You've been researching a little bit about Mr. Monk's background. And I know by the questions that you guys have submitted, your teachers have submitted to me, I know you guys have done a lot of hard work and preparation, and we'll get, probably be talking a little bit more about hard work and preparation here in just a moment. But what I'd like to do before we turn things over to Mr. Monk, I, I want to give a chance for all the schools to kind of show their school spirit, and, and uh, what I'm going to do is that when I call upon your school to recognize you as all the participants, that school can go ahead if you want to unmute your mics and give a shout or a clap or, or whatever it is that, that, that you might want to do. And then after that, please mute your mics and we'll go to the next group. So, well, let's see if our friends at Allendale, Michigan, Karen, is your group there? Do they want to say hello? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Allendale. Thank you, Karen. I'm glad you got in there. And let's go to uh, Spotsylvania, Virginia, Nye River Middle School. Are you there? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Spotsylvania. And let's go to Alabama, Huntsville, Mountain Gap. Did you guys get connected? Penny Hill. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mountain Gap. And let's go to the, the, the city for the first three programs you ever did with us. I can never pronounce it correctly. I kept pronouncing it Gloucester, and it's Gloucester. Let's go to Gloucester, New Jersey. Gloucester High School. Okay. Thank you, Gloucester. And let's go to the great state of Wisconsin, obviously home of the Super Bowl champions, Green Bay Packers. Let's go to Cumberland Middle School. Yay, Packers! Yeah! High school. High school. Damn. Cumberland High School. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> and let's go to uh, Webster Middle, Middle School. Hopefully that's a middle school. Webster. <laughs> Okay, Webster, thank you. And last but definitely not least, let's go to Indiana, Akron, Indiana. There's an Akron, Ohio just north of us. Uh, Akron, Indiana. Let's go to Tippecanoe. Let's go, Bears. Woo! Bears. 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 Bears.
And, and I will say, Tip of Camilla, you're, you're, I'm getting a little feedback from you guys. You might want to pull your mic back away from maybe it's close to your speaker. But uh, thank you, Tip of Canoe. I want to thank all the groups again uh, for joining into this program. Um, and I'd like now to introduce our, our, our featured speaker here today, and that's Art Monk from the class of, of 2008. And let me read a little information about Art Monk's career. He was born December 5, 1957, in White Plains, New York. He was a first-round pick, obviously, by the Washington Redskins in the 1980 draft. In his first season, he caught 58 passes to earn all-rookie honors. He had 50 or more receptions in nine seasons and gained 1,000 yards five different times throughout his career. At, at that time, it set then NFL records for catches in a season, most consecutive games with at least one reception at 164. And at that time, uh, part through, way through his career, he had held the record for the most career receptions at 820. As many of you know now, Jerry Rice holds that record. Uh, he finished his career with 940 catches. He was named to three Pro Bowls. He was all pro-choice pro twice. And obviously, as I already said, the, the biggest honor an individual player can receive is being inducted here into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. And he, was, he had that honor bestowed upon him in 2008. Now, that's you know, a lot about his on-the-field career. And as we look at his on-the-field career, obviously there's all kinds of highlight moments in his career, and probably highlighted one by uh, Super Bowls as well as as well as well induction into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, especially as an individual. Uh, but what I think you'll find is that his off-the-field achievements uh, are as amazing, or if not more amazing, than what he's been able to, to do, as many of our Hall of Famers have done. Uh, he is the co-founder and managing partner of Alliant. And to give you guys a little information about Align, Align is a 100% minority-owned and operated company that represents the Visa and MasterCard Association and sponsoring banks that specialize in credit and debit card processing and related services. Uh, and with that company obviously being a co-founder, he's responsible for pretty much everything, but uh, primarily in the business development, sales and marketing, and managing the administrative side of the company. Among all his business endeavors, R makes numerous public appearances speaking about business strategies, and, and most importantly, I think to him, is probably uh, speaking about his commitment to youth. Uh, he's someone that has a deep passion for his community, especially for the youth. His focus with youth is based on his belief that education is the key to all of our future. We hear that over and over again, and, and Art, will, will, I'm sure, will repeat that throughout his speech. Uh, so it's the key to the future of our youth, and his uh, community engagement that he's involved with reflect that. He co-sponsored the I Have a Dream program, which, get this, guaranteed a college education for 60 elementary schools in Washington, D.C. He also created the Good Samaritan Foundation, which provided a wide range of academic development and value-based education programs. And one thing that, that he's well known for, uh, both on and off the field, is his preparation and work ethics. And you've talked to other players that played against him or played with him, uh, his work ethic was, was really unparalleled. He's been called by many uh, a man of few words, but as you can see from what I just read to you guys, I think uh, something can be pretty simply stated about him with art is actions speak louder than words. And I think one thing that you will find here today is, uh, as he's talking, how all these things that he's done tie in again to those six core pillars that you guys have all been researching. But before I introduce Art uh, to have some opening remarks to you guys, I would like to show a little snippet of his highlight of his career. And a quick 30 second snippet on that. Art Monk was the Redskins' number one draft selection in 1980. When he retired 16 years later, he was the NFL's all time leader in pass receptions. Riffin is back, looking for Monk on the out pattern. He's got it at the 27. What a great record to break, and a well-deserved honor for Art Monk. And we'll go ahead and stop it there, and if all the groups can unmute their mics for a second and join me in giving a round of applause to class of 2008 pro football inductee uh, and Redskin great Art Monk. Uh, the mic is yours, sir. Well, good morning. Um, gosh, I got 
goosebumps or chill when I saw that little video clip. It's, it's been so long ago, but all it seemed like it was yesterday. But it's good to be here with you today. It's exciting to be a part of this Hall of Fame, part of a Hall of Fame series. I am a little envious of you guys. You know, we didn't have this technology when I was your age, um, but it's a great way of learning, great way to meet new people, understand um, new environments, new cultures, learn about people and places, languages. And um, I understand that this series is about the heart of a Hall of Famer and character and integrity. And, um, <clears throat> and I can share this a little bit with you of when I was growing up. You know, I was a very talented kid. I loved sports. We did everything. You know, we, we didn't have the video games that you guys have, so everything we did was outdoors. And we played games from sun up to sundown. And, you know, when the lights, street lights went out, you know, you hear people's parents calling them to come in the house, but we wanted to stay out as long as possible to play. But as talented as I may have been and several of my friends were, my mother would always pull me aside and say, you know, success, yes, it's great that you're talented and you love to play sports and athletics. Um, obviously, it's important to get your education as well. But success isn't always driven by your ability to think and learn and run and jump and catch. But success is really based on who you are as a person and how you conduct yourself as, as a young man and as a young woman. And so, you know, as, as a young kid, you know, I didn't, uh, that didn't stick so much to me then. I didn't really understand what she was saying until I got a little older and uh, went through life and, you know, went through some situations in my life that really made me began to make me think about what my mom and my dad used, used to tell me growing up about those things. And I began to change my, my thinking about how I approached life and who I was as not only an athlete and a student, but as a person as well. And I realized that the latter, how I conducted myself as a man, was more important really than anything else. And it was that that was really going to uh, make me successful in everything that I eventually uh, went on to do, uh, in addition to just athletics. And so I hope that, you know, after all, I answer all of your questions and our time here today, that uh, if you don't get anything else, that is, that's that piece of it that will, will really stick with you. And um, hopefully that will help you as you continue to go through your education and go on to college and uh, whatever profession that you decide to go into. So uh, right. I'm open thank to... You. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Monk. And what we will do is, uh, just to let you guys know the format, is we are going to work in the order uh, uh, questions will be Allendale High School will be first in just a moment Allendale will get you guys in just a moment Nye River, Mountain Gap Gloucester and then Cumberland and obviously as we discussed with Webster and Tiffany you guys will be hanging on as a view only group there so appreciate you guys tuning in uh, but one thing I want you guys to do is, as, as you're uh, thinking about which question you want to ask out of that list that you guys sent me Allendale one of the things I want you guys to do is, is think about this you have the opportunity today to engage and interact with one of the greatest football players that has ever played in the National Football League. When you think of the great wide receivers in the NFL today, whether it's the Randy Moss or the T.O.s or whoever you're a big fan of, um, they aspire to be in his shoes someday and be a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And I would guess that they would aspire to be the man that he is and, and all the achievements that he has off the field as well. So you guys have one, uh, you know, an amazing opportunity. That's what I love about doing this program. Now, you'll see I'll have right in front of me, and I've already started taking notes already. Uh, I've been able to do this now with about 12 Hall of Famers, so I, I take notes and try to apply things to my life as well because learning takes place in, in all different environments and at all day, different stages of your life. So you guys have a great opportunity to learn from one of the very best. And because he was a or the reason why he was the very best is because at the core were those six core characters that you guys are, are talking about. So with that being said, what we're going to do is, is I'll ask the group to unmute your mic, ask your question. If you can unmute your mics in between the questions as well, um, that would be greatly appreciated just to minimize any background noise. Uh, each group will get two questions, and we'll rotate through as many times as we can until the program ends. So with that being said, let's go to our friends in Michigan. Allendale, go ahead with your questions. Hello, Mr. Monk. I am Kyle Lannis. My question to you is, as you went through your career, 
Who or what person influenced you? Who was your role model? Um, gosh, I, I think I just I think I just spoke about them. Um, it was my parents. Um, I think they were probably the most influential in my life because um, as wild and crazy as I tried to be sometimes as a, as a young youth, um, they always pulled me back in. And, you know, they never just kind of let me have my way. Um, I was, they were very disciplinary. They were disciplinarians. And so, you know, I respected them. I did what I was told. But they really, they really just didn't um, discipline me or do those things just for the sake of, because I was a child. They really wanted to instill in me some values that were really going to really allow me to succeed in life. And they kept hammering those things in me. You know, even when I got into college, when I called home, they would still talk about those things. And I'm saying, yes, okay, okay, okay. You know, like, I didn't really understand it then. But as I got older, I really did, and I appreciate what, what, they, what they did for me. Because if it wasn't for, for them continuing to push those things, those values into me, uh, I would be the person that I am today. And of course, my role model, well, they were my role models too, but in, in athletically, you know, I grew up watching um, Charlie Taylor, Paul Warfield, and Otis Taylor. They were all receivers. And um, I just kind of admired, they were big receivers, because I was a big for my size as a receiver too, at least in, in the early days. And uh, so I kind of liked the way that they played the game. I modeled myself after them. And uh, so I always, at, as, as a football, you know, young football guy, I always looked at them for, you know, my inspiration and in trying to be like them. And, and two of those folks that Mr. Monk mentioned, uh, their bronze bust is in here as well in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So. Uh, let's go ahead and go to your second question there, Allendale. Hi, my name is Ryan Senna, and Mr. Monk, what was the hardest thing you went through in your life, and how did you overcome it? Um, oh, that's a good question. The hardest thing. Um, in life or in sports? Life. In life. Wow. You know... <laughs> There was this uh, young girl in high school that uh, I had a crush on big time. And, uh, you know, we, we dated for a little bit. And, uh, you know, she sent me this note one day. <laughs> so said, said, it's all over. And, uh, man, that crushed me. I mean, it was just like, what? You know, how could she do that? <laughs> And, um, you know, I was a big guy in high school, you know, thought, at least I thought I was. And, um, you know, she really kind of put me in my place. And, um, and that, that was, that was, I mean, it was, that was a, it, that was a hard thing for me to go through. I mean, I, I really liked her and, you know, I was, wasn't just a, you know, temporary thing for me. But, uh, you know, hey, I realized that life goes on and I was young and, you know, I still had a whole, life ahead of me, you know, I was still had the aspirations of going to school, you know, to college and do things. And so I kind of, I got over it. Um, but as, as far as life goes, that's probably the, the toughest thing I, I went through. You know, I lost my dad about seven years ago. You know, he passed away to cancer. And um, <clears throat> he passed away right in front of me. I, I, I he had cancer that was, you know, it was just a matter of time. So we kept him home, and uh, so I was there for his last moments, and that was a that was a difficult time. But you know, I there's 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 something that I that I believe in and stand on, and that is just my my faith in the Lord. And um, you know, we all go through hard times, and but when you have something um, that you really believe in and stand on. That can, you know, the Bible says that He will never leave you or forsake you. So He's He's a person that is, He's a God that is always there for me, for us who believe in Him and uh, and believe on His word. And so, regardless of what happens, circumstances that happen in our lives or in my life, I know that there's there's one person there that's never going to change. And I think in my Hall of Fame speech, I kind of sort of talked about that by saying, man will always disappoint you. Man will always let you down, 
but the word of God always stands true. It, ne it never returns void. And so that is something that I can always rely on, always depend on, and always find comfort in. And something that will always pull me through no matter what circumstances I'm, I may go through. So that is how I've always gotten out of things. And I was raised that way, uh, again, with uh, my mom and dad were, were strong believers in, in God and, and in Jesus Christ. And so, um, again, as a young man, I kind of turned, didn't understand it then, but later in my life, I began to appreciate it and understand it and apply it to my life. And, and uh, so it's really the most important thing for me now. Thank you. Sure. And thank you, Mr. Monk, for sharing that. And, and I, I think the, those two stories about his girlfriend and his father passing is, is really important for you guys to hear because now you understand that he's just like you guys. He, he got dumped in high school. Sorry to put that bluntly, but uh, he got dumped in high school. He's not yeah. immune to, to uh, uh, family members passing away. He's just like you and I. The old saying, you put one pant leg on at a time, that's true. He puts it one pant leg at a time. And I think that's important to realize that he was set in the classroom in probably very similar shoes to many of you. And look at the success that he's been able to achieve because of those those six, because of the characters that were instilled in him by his family and by his belief. So I appreciate you sharing that, Art. Uh, let's go to Virginia. I don't know how far away from you guys are from Art. Maybe you can walk over and say hello, but I don't know where Spotsylvania is in Virginia. But go ahead with your question, Nye River. What characteristic do you think is the most important? Um, good old Spotsylvania, you're only about 45 minutes away from me, so I, I know who you guys are. Um, probably, you mean the, the six pillars of character, which, is, which one do I think is the most important? Yeah. Is that what your question is? Probably, um, you know, as, as I read through them, you know, I got them here, trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairness, caring, and citizenship. And obviously they're all vital, very important. Um, but I think if I had to grab one or maybe two, I would say trustworthiness and citizenship because you can almost, you can almost um, bundle everything else into those two. You know, someone who's very trustworthy in this, you can, you can rely on them, you can depend on them, you can respect them, for how they carry themselves, a good citizen, citizenship, someone who, um, how they conduct themselves within their community. And I talked about that earlier about, it's not always about what you're able to do or how talented you are or what you're able to accomplish, but who you are as a, as a young man and a young woman and how you conduct yourself and how you treat people. Um, I think is, is what's really going to propel you into really being successful in life. And so if I had to name one, I'm going to name two here, I would say trustworthiness and citizenship. Okay, you have another one, Nye River. <laughs> hey, Art, you might want to give a shout out to the uh, Redskins jersey that was standing next to her. Oh, you no, gave I me a... I missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> Is there another question? We got two questions, right? Yep. Um, hi, Mr. Monk. My name is Brian Olvera, and what is your greatest achievement on the football field? Um, We're listening to this one, Art, in Canton, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, you know what? I, I mean, obviously, you know, making the Hall of Fame is. Um, you know, as a young athlete or coming into the NFL, you know, for me, I just wanted to make the team. I, you know, it was just unbelievable that I was standing on, on an NFL team with, with guys who had watched on TV playing, and I'm playing with them, and I'm playing against them. And so for me, it was just like, wow, I'm, I'm here. Hopefully I can stay a little bit. Um, once I kind of got past that point, then it was, you know, trying to get to a Super Bowl. We accomplished not one, but four of those. And then obviously, you know, then obviously you want to have individual success, you know, you want to have team success, but you want to be able to say that you really contributed and did well yourself. 
and I think I was able to do that and make, make the Pro Bowl and, and, and those sort of things. But the ultimate goal, I think, for every player is to, is to hopefully be a candidate for, you know, uh, for the Hall of Fame. And that, for me, was just, you know, unachievable <laughs> because, um, you know, when I watched guys in the NFL growing up, I always saw them, like, way up here. And even though I felt like I did have some kind of talent, I didn't think I quite measured up to that. But at the end of my career, somehow some people who were voting just thought that I was good enough to be there. So I made it 2008. I was uh, blessed to go in with a, with a former team, with also a teammate of mine in Darrell Green. And um, gosh, it was just, um, I, it, it's really hard to explain just the, the feeling that you get when you, when you have that the HOF kind of that's tagged after your name. It's almost like, you know, you get a doctor degree or something, you put, you know, doctor so-and-so or have those, those initials kind of after your name for whatever you've accomplished in life. And so I'm able to do that. And uh, it's, just, it's just a great feeling. Um, so I would probably say, I would have to say, making the Hall of Fame was probably my greatest achievement in athletics. And to give you guys a little little uh, tidbit on, on his induction ceremony, I've, I've been here for 11 years and even talking to some of the folks, who, uh, names that Art, Art knows, uh, Joe Org and Dave Mott, guys that have been here for 30 plus years here. Uh, I, Art had the longest standing ovation. The city of Canton was Redskin Nation during that weekend. Uh, literally, it was, it was literally uh -huh. Redskins fans. And uh, he had funny. the longest standing ovation in our enshrinement history, I believe. I think it was like a five minute standing ovation that he had. It, it was amazing. That uh, they wouldn't sit down, and uh, I can only imagine the feeling being up on stage as all those fans were wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't sit down, wouldn't put clapping because of how you know how proud you made you, you made them. Yeah. I'm sure they made you feel proud right there as well. So um, absolutely, I think that was the unofficial record, unofficial record. Well, thank you, uh, Nye River. Let's go to Alabama, Huntsville, Mountain Gap. Looking at the. Uh, combine this week the how important do you think character plays in, in uh, looking at athleticism and character on and off the court field um, and who would be your number one draft pick <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it's important to, to consider the character of um, whoever that you're looking at to, to be a part of your team I, I know when I came in Back in 1980, seems like forever ago, um, th there was a group of guys called the Over the Hill Gang, and they were they were old guys um, who had played for you know 12, 13 years. And um, when I when I came in, you know, I was the number one draft pick. I was a young kid, and you know, I came in. I thought I was you know. You know, the new guy on the team, I'm, you know, kind of number one draft pick. But they didn't care. They didn't care who I was. They didn't care if I was number one draft pick. They didn't care how much money they were supposed to going to pay me or anything like that. They wanted to know how I was going to help them win. And um, so when I became a part of that team, you know, they would pull me out, you know, before practice. They would keep me after practice. And... And in a way, they were testing me to see how I was going to respond. You know, was I going to complain or was I going to, you know, say I don't need to do this or I don't want to do this or whatever. And so back then, you really had to earn your respect and earn um, your stripes, your feathers is what we call it. As a redskin, you know, we have you know, this logo with the, with the feathers there. And on the helmet, we have those feathers. So all the rookies who came in, we didn't have that patch on our helmet. It was just a blank helmet because it was, it was like you were a nobody. But you had to earn your feathers. And so when you earned it, then you got that logo stuck on the side of your helmet. And so they wanted, they tested you to see what kind of person you were, what kind of character, what kind of guy you were really coming in here to be. A, were you going to be a guy who would just kind of stand off and be on your own? Or were you really going to be a part of the team and help the team win to succeed and do whatever, you, whatever was necessary to be successful and, and, and accomplish, you know, have a winning season. And so, really, I think um, 
when you look at bringing guys in on your team, you want guys who are going to be unselfish. You want guys who are going to be um, team players. You want guys who are going to work hard and, and, and do everything that they can to not only perform, the, perform well themselves, but to help others perform well as do well as well. And I and I give an example as Coach Gibbs, who was our coach, who was also a Hall of Famer. His philosophy was, I don't care how talented these kids are. Yes, they can run fast, they can jump high, and they're strong, and they're very athletic. But I want kids coming in here who have who are, who are, have uh, who are who are great kids, kids of uh, guys of character, guys who um, I can count on. Um, when I asked him to do something. So he really didn't care how talented we were. He wanted character guys to come in and be a part of our team. And I think if you look at our team, you know, some of you weren't even, weren't even born back then probably, but the guys that Coach Gibbs really drafted and, brought and made a part of our team were guys who had good character, qualities, traits. And, um, and that's why we, we played well together. We played well for a long time. And we were successful, went to four Super Bowls. And we were consistent winners over, you know, year after year. And so I think, you know, for me, if I was an owner, if I was the head coach of a football team and going through the scouting combines and looking for players, yes, I want somebody who's talented and who can help me, you know, be exciting for my ball club. But I want somebody who I know I can trust and depend on, who's not going to cause me a lot of trouble, who's going to be a good representation of my team, who's going to be out in the community to do good things and not, you know, um, do bad things. So I think um, drafting based on character is, for me, is more important than, than drafting based on someone's athletic ability. I, I don't know who I, would, who I would pick in the draft um, this year. I, 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 you know, everyone's kind of got the, their eye on the Camden, the Camden Newton, what's his name, the quarterback? Camden. Cam Newton, um, I, I'm not so sure he would be my number one pick. I, I, I'll just say that. But um, <laughs> hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> and I think uh, in his response, though, as you talked about who they pick up on the, on the Redskins team, a person that would help the team, a person that would uh, be part of that team to win, you know, I, I guarantee you that's the same philosophy that, that uh, Mr. Monk here has with his business as well. He brings in folks that are going to be part of the team. And, and so that's one of the things that we love about and part of our mission here at the Pro Football Fame is to promote the positive value of the sport. There are so many parallels between on the field and off the field. Uh, it's the ultimate team sport. And uh, uh, so thank you for sharing that with us, Mr. Monk. Um, let's go to the second question, Mountain Gap. What was it like practicing against Daryl Green. Green every day? Um, <laughs> it was great. You know, I had a couple of years on Daryl. Um, so, you know, as, as a young rookie coming in, we always um, kind of put each other, put the young guys to the test to see if they could measure up. Like I said, when I came in, the guys, the older guys kind of pulled me out there and, and, and worked me out. And But Daryl was was exceptionally talented. I mean, obviously, he was the fastest guy in the NFL, very quick. Um, and as a defensive back, he was very responsive. And so, you know, he was, it, it was hard to kind of um, elude him um, so we can create separation for you to catch the ball. But because he was so quick and had a lot of speed, then what I learned to do is to use that against him. And so instead of running just a regular route uh, where he can cover me real tight, I would give him some moves, some, you know, some hints, or act like I was going to do one thing where he would bite on that, and then I'd do something else. And that gave me just enough time, enough separation, you know, two or three steps to be able to beat him. And so we always had what we called, uh, at the end of practice, uh, we, had, we had two drills that we had. We had one was called the Rigo drill which is John Riggins, um, where John never practiced, first of all. 
So at the end of practice, <laughs> at the end of practice, that's when he practiced. And we would run like 10 plays in a row, 10 running plays in a row, just for just all John Riggins. He would go off tackle or whatever we would call for him. And then we would have our, our little competition between the wide receivers and, and the defensive backs. And Daryl at that time, you know, I was kind of the number one receiver then, and he was kind of taunted as the number one back. We would always get, go against each other. And so being that Daryl Green is not here, I'm going to tell you my story. And so... <laughs> <laughs> it, it was great. It was <laughs> it was great com competing against them, and of course, you know, I, I schooled them, meaning you know I, I I beat him. So, you know, at the end of practice, you know, I pat him on the back and say, okay, maybe tomorrow, we, you know, you have a chance of, of, of making an interception or or stopping me from catching the ball. But times like that, you know, are are is really what made us a great team. You know, because he was a talented defensive back, and we had others too. We had other great wide receivers, Charlie Brown back then, Virgil C. Then came along Gary Clark and Ricky Sanders. Uh, we always competed against each other because we made each other better. That was the whole idea. Not to just say, oh, I could beat you, I'm better than you. But to really make each other better and help work out. You know, if I wanted Daryl to, if I saw something on film against a guy that we were going against, and... Um, I wanted to really work against that particular thing, I would ask Darrell to kind of model that for me in practice so I can work on that. So when I got into a game against that guy, I kind of was already had an idea of how I wanted to beat that particular defensive scheme that he was playing against me. So it was, although we competed against each other, it was always with the idea of making each other better so we can perform better and hopefully win in the game. Do you still talk to Darrell? I still talk to Darrell. We're, we have a great relationship, obviously. We played together for mm, 12 years, went into the Hall of Fame together. Uh, so we, we have a great relationship. It's been, it's been a great time, obviously, playing with him uh, during, all those, during all those years. And, um, you know, just some great moments. And, uh, Mr. Monk, just to tell you, uh, I think Daryl Green's going to be doing one of these programs coming up, so we'll get his take on it. <laughs> right over here. So, <laughs> okay. Let's go ahead. Let's go to Gloucester, New Jersey. What do you miss most about football? I'm I'm sorry. What was that? What do you miss most about football? What do I miss most about football? That's really easy. I miss the camaraderie, or meaning the friendships, my teammates. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that I played with a group of guys that we played together for 12, 13 years. It was a core of guys who, um, it, it wasn't like today's game where with free agency you've got guys, they're here for two or three years and then they're off on another team somewhere. We had a core of guys that played together, stayed together for about 12, 13 years. And because of that, we became very close, um, like, like family. Uh, we didn't just practice together and play games together, but we did things together off the field, barbecues, vacations. You know, their kids called me, me and my wife, uncle and auntie, and then my kids called them uncle. And you know, so it was, it was a really close-knit um, family. We worked hard together. You know, we, we laughed together. We cried together, you know, during the difficult times. We persevered through the struggles that we may have had in various seasons or in someone else, or someone's personal life, maybe with somebody, you know, getting hurt or passing away. It was um, relationships that were established and built not just on football, but because of who we were. And, and, and Joe Gibbs, again, was, a, was responsible for helping to cultivate that type of environment on our team. And so now when everybody's, you know, retired and, you know, gone in different ways, we're still very close. We still keep in contact with each other, but we miss those times being together in practice in the locker room and, you know, you know, telling jokes and playing gags on each other, you know, throwing hot water on somebody or, you know, something that was just kind of kept the locker room fun and, 
and exciting. And so those are that's what I really miss most about uh, the game. Obviously, the games were exciting, going to Super Bowls and and all of those things. But just those friendships probably mean more than anything else to me. So that's what I miss the most. Okay, glad with another one, Gloucester. What is the biggest piece of advice that you have for young people? What, what is the, I'm sorry? You have to speak up a little bit louder in Gloucester. What is the biggest piece of advice that you would have for young people? Biggest piece of advice. Um, sort of related to what I spoke about earlier, about, um, I, I call it your, 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 um, your giftings versus your character. And obviously all of you, I'm sure, are gifted or developing gifts in a lot of different areas. Some of you are athletic. I see someone back there yawning. <laughs> so so <laughs> um, um, some of you are very talented, very smart. Um, and obviously your giftings or your talents are going to are going to take you so far. In other words, I, I was an athlete, and you know, coming out of high school, wanting to go to college, and being drafted into the NFL, um, very talented. But my my gifts only took me so far. It came a point in my career where somebody told me, "Well, you can't play you can't play this game anymore, or we don't want you anymore." And so at that particular point in time. My, my gifts came to an end. And some point in time in your lives, your, your talents or your giftings or what you're good at is going to come to an end or, or it's going to become diminished. And so really to be successful, the, the success of your gifts will take you so far, but it's the, it's the success of who you are as a person and how you conduct yourself as a human being is what's really going to allow you to be successful for the rest of your life. So when your giftings or your talents or whatever you're good at comes to an end or they're diminished or no one wants you to work for a corporation anymore or wherever you may find yourself in life, those may, you know, go away. But who you are as a person, your character, your integrity, that you are, who you are as a, as a human being, as a young man, as a young woman, will carry you as, until, you, until you die. And so that's, that's my advice, and to not just work on becoming stronger and faster, and not just co continue to do those things, yes, and continue to study and work hard so that you can go on and be, you know, the doctors and lawyers or whatever it is that you want to be. But at the same time, don't do that and then be a jerk, you know. You want to be a, a, a solid human being, someone who treats people right, co conducts themselves in a manner that's appropriate. So where, no matter where you find yourselves, you'll be successful because of that. Thank you, Gloucester. And let's go to Wisconsin, Cumberland, Cumberland High School. All right, hi, Mr. Monk. Uh, I'm Ricky Hermita. Being from Wisconsin, we just watched the Green Bay Packers win the Super Bowl. And as a member of Super Bowl championship teams, how did winning the Super Bowl help you or encourage you to be a successful, to have a successful career after football? Well, you know, we went, <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to be a part of four Super Bowls. And um, um, we won three of them, lost one. Um, but I, I think, I don't think it was the Super Bowl itself um, that helped me be successful after football. I think it was a, probably the process of getting to the Super Bowl um, and just being uh, in athletics, period, is what kind of helped me after when my career was over. Obviously, getting to the Super Bowl, we had to overcome a lot of adversity. And, um, you know, you win some and you lose some. And there were times, you know, during the season where we, we, we just didn't win. And we find ourselves in a rut. And, uh, but we found a way to, to overcome that and get out of it and get on top of that uh, to win again and to find ourselves in the Super Bowl. But I think just
just just as in athletics, period, you know, you learn how to. Um, obviously, it's a team sport, so you have to learn how to work with other individuals. You have to not just be selfish and try to, as a receiver, wanting the ball off for myself, but the ball had to be spread around, and I had to run routes not to catch the ball, but I had to run routes to help somebody else catch the ball. And then I had to run downfield and block to help our running backs be successful. And so it was, it's about being part of a team. It's about being unselfish. It's about um, being on time. You know, our, our coach was very de demanding on when we had a meeting at 10 o'clock, you're there at 9.45. If you're, if you're there at 9.46, you're late. Um, and you represent your organization well. You know, you don't, you know, when we travel, we don't go out into a, another city and start acting crazy, but you, you, you represent your organization in a manner that is appropriate. So it's a lot of, a lot of character traits that are built because of sports and because of a particular season of hardship that really help you to be successful when the game is over. And so now, you know, that I have my own business, I, I, I'm able to lead my own business, um, I'm able to manage a group of employees, um, I've, I, I know how to be there on time, I know how to be there early, and I know how to stay late, um, I know how to, you know, work as a team with, with other individuals from, you know, different cultures or from different ways of doing things. I know how I've learned how to motivate people and inspire people, um, and so it's really those things, the qualities and the things that I've learned <clears throat> in football, that has really helped me to be successful now into business and whatever I continue to do, you know, as far as now that football is over. And I, I think that's important to note that you know you're not always uh, the reward isn't necessarily in the outcome, but it's in the journey to get there. Uh, winning, because we're not always going to win the Super Bowl. He, he was fortunate enough to win three out of four. I know Tony is probably sitting off the left or right of uh, Art Monkey, the Buffalo Bills fan. They went to the Super Bowl four years in a row and lost every one of them. Does that mean that they didn't work as hard as, as, as Art and the rest of their team? No, just, you know, certain things just didn't work out that way. And that same thing can be applied in everything, whether it's a test uh, that you're taking. You might not always be an A student. You might not be a 4.0 person. But it's important, that I guarantee you, if you continue to – devote yourself and be dedicate, dedicated and persevere that you're going to be a success. It might not be an A student, but it might be a B plus or whatever it might be. And I can tell you as an employer, and I'm sure Art would uh, agree with this as well, is as an employer, if I had an A student that didn't really show much initiative or effort, if I was looking at their resume, and a C plus or a B minus student that I know he, uh, he or she busted their tail and did everything they possibly could to, to try for that test or, or that, that grade, and maybe they're just a, a you know B student. Uh, I'm going to take that person that busted his or her tail because they showed initiative. Yeah. So we're going to um, uh, you know those are things to, to keep in mind as, as you're doing this. The reward is not always in the outcome, but in the journey to get you there. So let's go ahead and uh, go to Cumberland. Another question. All right. And what is the hardest part of running your own business? Um, the hardest part is probably just managing people. I mean, it's almost like being a head coach. You know, football, you've got, you know, 45 guys or so on a team. They all come from different backgrounds, different <laughs> ways of doing things. You know, football is football, but everybody has their own, you know, perception of how they want to do things. And so it's just managing people is probably the hardest thing, getting people to be on the same page, to, to uh, work together, to work hard together to, you know, overlook, you know, someone else's shortcomings or maybe an inability to be able to do something as well as you can. Um, so I, I would probably say just, just managing people. You know, everything else kind of kind of handles itself. Um, but the people you get, you know, when I, when, I hire, when I hire people, I don't just hire anybody. Uh, yes, you may be a, a great accountant or someone that, has, has, has a very good knowledge of the industry that I work in, but I need somebody who's going to, and we, we talked about this, this in the other question about someone who's a team player and who comes in early, stays late, understands being on time. I want somebody who's, who I can count on and, and depend on, 
who's trustworthy, like we talked about one of the, the six pillars, who um, I can depend on to be on time, get their work done, and you know not create a problem in the office. And so, you know, when we hire people, we we really kind of interview them two or three times and really just kind of get a good feel for who this person really is. Um, obviously, the resume will you know show that they graduated from such and such university and they've got all of these you know qualifications or, and, and abilities to do things. But I want to know who they are as a person and will they fit within what I'm trying to build in my office environment. And so, managing people, I think, is probably the the toughest thing and the, and the most important thing if you're going to have a successful business. Okay, and thank you, Cumberland High School. And we'll start back from the top. It looks like we have about 10 minutes left in this in this conference, so let's uh, let's do one from each school. We'll go back to Allendale in Michigan. Go ahead with your question. Yeah, these coming up here, Jerry. I wanted to let you know too, Jerry. We have kind of a special audience today. This is it. Actually, is our high school football team and some of their coaches. So it's really special for us to share this. Hi, my name, hey, my name is Aaron Wickstrom, and what factors contributed to your decision to play football at Syracuse? Oh, that's the easy one. My mama. Um, uh, sheesh. I was um, highly recruited coming out of high school, and um, out of all the, you know, the letters and people that were interested, I, I kind of narrowed it down to four schools that were relatively close to where I lived. I wanted my parents to be able to come and see me. Boston College, University of Maryland, Syracuse University, and Penn State. And um, so my, my mom, because my dad worked, couldn't come, my mom and one of my aunts came to all the visits with me to the schools. Went to Penn State, uh, Joe Paterno, uh, we went out to spring practice, Joe Paterno said, I want you to go walk, look over with that group and watch them. And as I was going over there, it was the linebackers, because I played defense as, as well. And so when I, I, I looked back and I said, well, those are linebackers. And he said, yeah, I want you to watch, watch them. So right then I knew I wasn't going to Penn State because um, I, I didn't want to play defense. Uh, so went to Boston College, went to Syracuse, uh, and then went to University of Maryland. I had made up my mind to go to University of Maryland. That's where I wanted to go. I actually told the head coach that I was coming. And my mom heard, heard, overheard the conversation on the phone with them saying that I was coming, but she didn't know who I was on, on the phone with. So when I hung up, she said, who was that? And I said, well, that was, you know, University of Maryland. I, I told them I was, you know, was coming there. She said, oh, no, you're not. And I said, okay, well, <laughs> where am I going then? <laughs> she said, you're going to Syracuse. And I said, well, okay, well, I guess that's where I'm going then. <laughs> I didn't argue, I just said, uh, all right. And uh, so I ended up going to Syracuse. And uh, she felt like um, Syracuse was a place where I wasn't going to get in trouble. Uh, I don't know why she thought I was going to get in trouble at the University of Maryland. But in any case, Syracuse is where she said I was going. So that's where I ended up. And it ended up being the right place for me. So that's where I went. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. The, the football team there in Allendale, Michigan, we appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, let's go to Nye River. Okay. Where is it? Hi, Mr. Monk. I'm Christian Sherman. And what was the most inspirational message or action that ever happened to you or anyone ever said to you? Um, yeah, you know, it was probably in high school, um, it wasn't an inspirational message, <laughs> but it, it really uh, inspired me to um, really kind of prove the person wrong, and it was my guidance counselor, no less, um, in high school, you know, going uh, to Syracuse, she felt like that wasn't the right place for me to go. Uh, she thought a, a small school was probably, I would be more successful at. Um, uh, she, you know, she didn't really believe I was as, 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 um, as gifted an athlete that I, I may have been or as smart of a student as 
she didn't think I would I would succeed at Syracuse. She felt like it was it was too big of an institution, um, and I wouldn't be able to maintain my academics or even perform on that level as a, as a Division One school. And so I left the office, and I just said, I I, I don't believe that. And, um, and so it just kind of made me mad that here she, here she was my guidance counselor. I, I guess she felt like she was giving me the right information. Um, but I just felt like she was discouraging more than she was encouraging me. And um, even though it wasn't an encouraging message, I was encouraged by it because I was determined to prove her wrong. And uh, so, and I, and I did. I mean, I had a very successful athletic career there. And I had a, a successful academic career that I graduated on time and um, got my degree where a lot, of, a lot of my teammates that year, not a lot of them, but several of them did not graduate. And so um, my mother was a big part of that too, making sure that I, that I kept my grades up. But, um, so that was probably you know, the most, it wasn't an inspirational message, but the, the thing that probably inspired me the most in my life, both on an academic level or on an uh, athletic level. Okay, thank you, Nye River. And I think Mountain Gap had to duck out of the conference. Uh, who knows, they might have got hit with a surprise fire drill. You never know, those always happen in school. So maybe a tornado drill. If you, <laughs> if you guys ever did those when you were in, when you were in school, but I, I remember yeah, those. Good. We had to go in the basement. <laughs> That's right. Let's go to Gloucester, New Jersey. Can you, can you say that again? Repeat that, please. Did you do something for good luck before you played a game? Did I, did I do something for good luck before I played a game? Yeah. yeah. I, okay. Um, not really, but we did have a lot of guys who were supersti superstitious, I guess is the right word. We had coaches that would always wear the same outfit. Um, we had players, and I guess maybe I did. I had to have my I had to have my uniform on a certain way. If, if I didn't feel comfortable in my uniform, you know, I would take it off, and then just put it back on. You know, I I know that's kind of weird, but um, if I didn't feel right in it, I, I just didn't feel like I was going to play very well. And we had other guys who, you know, they had to eat certain meals, uh, or they had to get to the stadium on time. Or, you know, just little things like that where, you know, it felt like if you didn't do it, that you weren't going to have a good game. And so, you know, for me, you know, if my uniform didn't feel right on me, um, I just, you know, for some reason, I just didn't feel The conference right. is about to end. <laughs> Don't worry, that's, a, that's just... our five-minute warning from the bridge. We're still good. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay let's go to... Uh... Uh, for the last question of the program, it's it's fourth and goal. It's uh, you know the last play of the game. The pressure is on Cumberland High School in Cumberland, Wisconsin. Go ahead with the last question of the program. Okay, how did you originally come up with your business idea? Um, it wasn't it wasn't really an idea. It was something that was you know an industry that was already you know in the works. It, it's Merchant services is actually credit card processing. And, you know, when, um, when I retired, I went into advertising and marketing with an advertising firm. And uh, the two guys, gentlemen, that I went into business with, when we talked about character, they, they just didn't have the right character. And uh, after a couple of years, I, just, I ended up resigning from that, from, from that. And then me and a former teammate then started looking for something that we wanted to uh, do have our own business and something. And so we ran into a gentleman out in California, no less, who was in this industry of credit card processing. And we just began to talk to him about, you know, the business and how we can possibly maybe get into it ourselves. And so um, his father-in-law lived here in uh, Spotsylvania, in fact, with one of the schools are in Spotsylvania. And um, he began to mentor us for about six months, teaching us the industry. 
And uh, those first six months, we, we did really well. And at that point, we decided to, to move forward and to, and to stay in it and became our, started our own business. And uh, we, just, we just began to grow. And um, there was a learning curve at first, just really getting to understand the industry and what it was all about and, you know, how the business worked. And then, um, you know, we started out in our own, in our own homes. Charles Mann was my, was my business partner. He, he worked out at his home. I worked out of mine, you know, for about a year and a half. And then we found a small office that we with uh, that was not being used in a friend of ours. So we we bought our consolidated our stuff together in a, in a very small office. Where it was still the two of us. Then as we grew, we began to be hired a person to help us. Then we hired two more people, and then we we got we grew to about maybe 10, 10 employees, and um, you know so it just it just kind of worked for us. But that's kind of how we got into it. And again, I think one thing you'll find, just like on the football field of starting a business, I guarantee you that there was some definitely some research, preparation, and long hours to get that to get that business started. As it continues to be as well as a business owner. Uh, so I mean, yeah. again, those those core character qualities uh, come into play. I appreciate all the schools for all their questions. I see we have about about two about a minute minute and a half left. Um, Mr. Monk, do you have any closing remarks you'd like to share with the the students here today? I, well, I, you know, again, I, I answered some very good questions. Some of them were, were, were very good questions that regarding to character and, and integrity. I, and, and, I, and I'll just, you know, rehash kind of what I said at the, at the opening. You know, it's, it's not always about, you know, what you're able to do or your talents, but it's about who you are as a human being, as a person, how you conduct yourself. That's really going to make you successful in life. People, especially people that these days, in the, in the type of uh, society that we have where people are just underhanded, you can't trust them, they're dishonest. Employees want good, solid people to be a part of their, their, their business and, that, and people that are going to represent them very well. And so if you maintain that type of um, attitude as you go out, go out through college and throughout the rest of your career, you're, you're going to be in high demand. Okay, well, can all the groups unmute your mic for, for a second and join me in saying thank you and give a warm round of applause for uh, Hall of Famer Art Monk. Thank you.